It does. It sounds like I'm going to get sued. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you are recording. Oh, I'm recording. No pressure. Where do I uh, speak to? Or? We have no microphone for this room itself. What's that? No microphone for this room. Okay, so just shout it out. Yeah. And it'll probably record down here. Yeah. Okay. Good. We can do that. Oh. That worked. Okay. Hi, everybody. I apologize for the delay. Uh, my name is uh, Angie Byron, or WebChick, uh, on Drupal.org. And uh, I am a uh, Drupal 8 core maintainer. I work for Acqui in the Office of the CTO. I'm a Drupal Association board member. I wrote a book on Drupal. I kind of try to get involved in Drupal in any way possible because it's awesome, and I love it, and I love the community. So what I'm going to talk about today is that my slides get cut off, which is not nice. I think it goes low. Screen, oh, really? It, it sounded like it was going to... Oh, okay. But I think still something is up with the thing and the stuff. That's it. Okay. Well, let me try it. Do we have a thing? Oh, we do. Wow, that was magical. I didn't know four inches could make that much of a difference. That's what she said. No, okay, anyway. Um, <laughs> So what we're going to talk about today is the Drupal 8 timeline. We're going to talk about changes planned for end users and site builders and themers and developers, oh my, and also talk a bit about how you can help. Um, so uh, I, I hear a lot of people saying, oh my god, why are you talking about Drupal 8? I just updated to Drupal 7 or I just downloaded Drupal 7 for the first time. This is why we worry about this. So the Drupal 8 timeline actually started, uh, oh, actually didn't start quite here. In January of 2011, that's when Drupal 7.0 shipped. That was after we had been working on that for three years. And then we began development in March of 2011, which was right after the Git migration, because we figured we'd only do one major horrible thing to people at once. And people actually like Git quite a bit, but uh, we didn't want to like sort of start development of our major new release and then also change the version control system under everybody. So Feature Freeze is this date at December 1st. Um, and what happens at Feature Freeze is we sort of, uh, like between uh, development and Feature Freeze, what we do is we sort of try and like cram as much stuff into Drupal as possible. So people are sitting there, you know, whatever really ticks them off, whatever is like something cool they really always wanted Drupal to do, or, you know, whatever that kind of thing, they just sort of dive in and try to like make that thing happen. When feature freeze happens, we sort of cut off the flow of features and instead we focus on bug fixes and stabilization. My slides are a little out of date. That date is now April 1st for code freeze. And then finally a release, and this is now September of 2013, of Drupal 8.0. So the goal is that you start with this huge funnel of all the features in the world, then you narrow it down to sort of refactoring and sort of like the cleaning and polishing things up. Then you actually stop making API changes so that contributed modules can update. And then finally you release the code to the world. And um, the reason why we talk about this now is feature freeze is right there, which as you can tell if you're any good at math is not very far away. Um, and so this was in August, we're now in November, so there's an even smaller little window here. So basically, if you've encountered anyone at this conference that was kind of freaking out and looking frenzied and baggy-eyed and such, it was because uh, they're trying to get their stuff done before Drupal uh, 8 feature freeze. And so frankly, now is the time to help Drupal kick ass. So I'm going to talk about some stuff that is actively undergoing a development, so I can't guarantee the accuracy of really any of this information. I just came. But um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on, and I want to also emphasize that there are a lot of people working on Drupal 8, but nobody who is like, you know, nobody owns Drupal 8. It's like, it's all a collaborative process by a number of different people in the community, and so really, unless you personally get involved, there's absolutely no guarantee that what you want to see happen is going to happen, so. Um, there's a number of major initiatives. We've also uh, launched the uh, Views and Core initiative along with these that are at varying stages of the analysis and design process. Um, and this was something new we did in Drupal 7. It was sort of like everybody going crazy on whatever they wanted to work on. And we still have a lot of that. But in Drupal 8, Dree sort of made the decision to focus people a little bit more and sort of pick a few different strategic initiatives um, that you know, numerous people out in the field were complaining about. You know, like configuration management, for example, is like, have you ever tried to like move something from you know, your dev server to your live server, and you like get out a napkin, right, and you start saying, click admin content types, and then do this, this, this. 
And it's not very sustainable because then you have to follow the napkin instructions over here. Or you try and do something like features and it's all funky. We need to solve that in core, out of the box, and so that's what that's running from. So all of these different pain points that we've long had in Drupal, sort of identifying people in the community to sort of like lead those things and sort of blessing them with an initiative owner type of role so that it sort of helps federate um, you know, leadership of the project. So these people get to um, dig in, come up with a situation like they say, you know, Larry Garfield, for example, really wanted to move Symphony components into core as like a new way of doing web services. They get to dig in, they help Dries with setting the technical direction of the project and such. So that's kind of how we're structured. And then, then beneath these people, there's literally hundreds, if not more than a thousand people working on patches all the time at any given day. Even things totally unrelated to this stuff that is also really cool. So um, here are a few proposed changes for end users and clients that we'll get into. The first one is the, the mobile initiative. Um, so we're heading into this you know, world, uh, these little planets. So there's a tiny blue little planet right down here like this. That represents all of the Drupal sites in the world. So even though we power like 2% of the internet right now, um, that's like us in relation to everybody else. Um, all CMS sites, so people using Joomla or Sitecore or one of these other CMS products, that represents this big planet. So we're only a tiny portion of the overall CMS. And then all the people not bothering to use a the CMS, they just make their site in Dreamweaver or whatever. You know, those people are over here. And then the explosion of mobile over the next five to six years um, is really starting to take off, particularly in um, not only in North America and stuff like that, but also in the you know areas like Africa and India. And you know, people often don't have desktop computers; they use everything on a mobile or a tablet or things like this. So we need to solve things like this, where you know when you install Drupal 7, you get this never-ending scroll bar like this. Um, you have to like really zoom in on your cell phone in order to see anything that's going on, and then. If you do install a responsive theme, it looks like this. So you get your toolbar all clapped up on top of each other, and it's kind of disgusting and such. Um, so what we're working on is fixing a lot of these kinds of things with doing responsive design out of the box and putting in uh, templates and stuff like that to support responsive design, as well as a redesigned toolbar, which is not pictured here, um, uh, to try and make it so that, and it's actually cool. It like swooshes, and like it's like, whoa, horizontal, whoa, vertical, and you can do all kinds of cool things. But you need that, right? Because you know, Apple just came out with an iPad mini, which had a completely different form factor than the regular iPad, which had a different form factor, again, from an iPhone. Never mind the little Nokia, whatever cell phone that people are using in India. You really have no control over what people are going to view your website with, so you really have to approach it from a sort of like content first and then having the design sort of flow around breakpoints and stuff. So a couple things that we've done um, is we've put into core a breakpoints module. And what breakpoints module lets you do is define different media queries that you can break your design on. And then different modules or themes can hook into that. So for example, um, the picture module, which is, not, which is different from the image module, and that's a little something we have to <laughs> sort out. But the picture module is basically for the HTML5 picture element. So like, say you upload a desktop wallpaper and it's this big. Right? And if you're on a desktop and you have like, you know, a huge bandwidth and stuff like that, it's totally acceptable to see an image this big on the home page. But if you're in the middle of downtown New York City and there was just a hurricane and you're barely getting a little 3G connection, you really don't want like a huge enormous image downloading on top of your mobile device. And so what picture module does is it allows you to specify a low bandwidth version essentially and it puts that one down in first and then grabs the higher resolution one on top of it if your device can support it. So we have all these kinds of sort of plumbing things in there to sort of help with that. And another uh, really big push in Drupal 8 is also around front-end performance. So this is a graph I stole off the internet somewhere. But the big thing to take away from this is that, you know, we do all of this work, especially in the Drupal community, to like optimize the back end. You know, like, let's use MongoDB and Memcache and Varnish and all these things, which is great and all, but really, the bulk of the request, the bulk of the time that someone spends to sit there and wait for their page to download is all front-end stuff. It's like parsing the DOM to figure out where to put little JavaScript actions and downloading external libraries and CSS files and things like this. All of that stuff adds to the page weight, and you really don't want page weight when you're on a tiny little device with a crappy processor and you're just trying to you know, find the session schedule for bad camp, for example. Um, so John Elbin is the, uh, is the lead of this initiative. They have an issue tag called uh, mobile, if you want to help on those. They're also sprinting on Monday and Tuesday 
on uh, mobile-related issues. So if you live in the area or you booked your plane ticket out later than that, um, I don't know exactly where they're sprinting. I think it's around here somewhere, but check the Bad Camp website. I think it's on there. Um, all kinds of really exciting stuff, though. Like, this is all, it's not even cutting edge anymore. It's really, we're behind the times. We need to get in front of the times. But definitely mobile stuff, if you haven't already worked in this area, this is something that's going to become way more relevant over the next couple of years. Um, authoring experience improvements is also an area. So these are people who are victims of Drupal, right? Because a lot of times what we do is we, like, you know, go there and we say, oh, we'll install these modules and panels and And then what do we do? We say, there's your site, and then we walk off and we go to the next site, right? But in the meantime, there's people whose job it is is to, like, actually put content on the website. So, like, make press releases and make, you know, post videos and post blog posts and stuff like that. And right now, Drupal presents a really frustrating experience for them, you know? Um, so we really, you know, Drees tried to push this as well as a major um, sort, of, uh, it, sort of initiative for Drupal. He kind of laid out this timeline back in, uh, in Denver where we'd sort of do an analysis and design phase, and then we're currently in implementation phase of a number of cool features that are going to hopefully, hopefully make it into Drupal 8 and make life better for everybody. Um, so one initiative that was spearheaded by the uh, Drupal usability team is uh, improving the content creation page. So this includes things like, you know, right now this is just like endlessly scrolling form. So the idea is like, oh, you know, there's a lot of these things that are not really relevant to most websites. You know, I mean, most pieces of content, you just care about filling out the primary fields and all of this other stuff is sort of secondary. So let's shove that over here on the right. So it's clear to people, like, this is the primary area and this is the secondary area. And, of course, on a mobile device, this is going to squish down and just be a single column again. But um, for the desktop experience, it's much easier. Um, we're trying very, very, very hard to put a WYSIWYG editor in core. Um, so the current direction is around Aloha editor, which is sort of an inline editing WYSIWYG HTML5 thing. Uh, there's also people in the community working on uh, uh, evaluating CK editor um, to see if that would be a good mix. But we really want to solve this because it is sort of patently ridiculous that we are going to put out a web, you know, a, a, a CMS, a thing to manage content in 2013 where you still have to hand type HTML tags in order to format your stuff. And it's one of those things that's a huge pain point. And although you can get it working with contributed modules, it's really difficult. Uh, it's really difficult to configure it securely because what a lot of people just do is like, let's turn on full HTML for everybody, which solves the problem, but then opens up all kinds of security problems. So we're really trying to get that out of the box, configured, ready to go. Um, and then a number of other styling improvements just to kind of improve the look and feel of the admin thing. Uh, Spark is an initiative launched by Acquia, where we're also taking on a lot of this stuff. I'm the engineering manager for the Spark team, and we have three full-time engineers, Wim Lears, Jesse Beach, and Gabor Hoishi, working on kind of trying to make Drupal 8 awesome for, for content editors. So some of the stuff we're working on is like in-place editing, where Instead of the current Drupal workflow where I'm like on my site and I see a typo, so I click edit and then I'm taken to a completely different screen that doesn't look like what I just saw. And if I try and preview that, it like shows my content twice in yellow and it doesn't actually show me what it'll look like. Then I hit save, hope for the best, and then repeat the process. What inline editing lets you do is actually click the you know, edit link there and it will highlight things on the page that you can click to inline edit. You just click it, type in your text, save, and you're done. Um, and that's going to be a much, much smoother workflow for people if we can get it in core, we hope. Um, another thing that we're working on as part of Spark is um, a bunch of the layouts type of stuff. So the ability to um, build dynamic layouts for your website, the ability to build responsive layouts for your website that respond at different media points. And so you can, like, you know, create this tool that, like, says, at, you know, for, for this width of device, do this. For this width of device, have these many columns and that kind of thing and automatically makes the uh, website responsive without you having to be a CSS expert. Um, so people leading this, this is Boyan Summers, uh, Roy Schulten. Uh, they meet every week in the usability channel on IRC. It's a great place to go find those guys. <coughs> Boyan is actually here. I don't know if they're doing any more sprinting, but it would be a, a great thing to go find those guys and help out. Proposed changes for site builders. So those were for end user clients. For site builders, we have things like uh, multilingual, so has anyone here tried to build a multilingual website before in Drupal? Yeah. How many modules? Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did I do that? Uh -huh. Whoa. Yes, you did. OK, sorry. <laughs> Electrifying. So how many modules did you have to install to do that? 
20, 25? All, like <laughs> All of them? Yeah, pretty much. It's like, you know, take, take anything with lengua or inna in it and just enable it all, and then hopefully you can configure it properly, right? Um, so the plan for Drupal 8 is to turn this kind of mess, where it's like, you need localization update, localize Drupal, and, you know, like content translation and entity translation and IETN and, you know, all these different kinds of things and really slim it down to just a couple of built-in modules uh, right out of the box. So I have a screenshot of this to show you, um, but actually just yesterday we committed the patch to actually put what is effectively IETN in core. So you can now in core set up um, multiple languages and you can uh, flip between those languages and you can translate your content, your taxonomy terms, uh, user profiles if you want, comments, any entity in the system, you can actually translate any field on that, uh, on that property. Um, and, and that's a big freaking deal. Um, we have a lot of work to do to make the usability of that a little bit nicer, but um, it's a really big deal that that's done. And uh, it's especially relevant because what they're trying to solve the problem of is in Drupal 7, there's sort of two directions you can go multilingual-wise. You can either go the content translation method, which creates multiple nodes and sort of bridges them together, or you go the entity translation method, which is, you know, one node with separate fields and each field is sort of translatable by itself. But if you choose one or the other, they are not compatible with one or the other at all. And so we're trying to get one situation where you can do one type of translation in Drupal 8. And those guys have made amazing progress and uh, really excited to see that. So those people will also be sprinting on Monday and Tuesday. So if you have felt the pain of multilingual and you'll be around, please join uh, Gabor Hoishi and a whole host of other european -y type people who are here trying to make uh, internationalization better. Um, and one other cool thing that we're, they're working on, they're not quite finished yet, but one other thing that they're working on, which would be awesome, is the ability to actually download translations during installation so you get a little select box with all of the different languages right on the first page of the installer. And wouldn't it be great if you could say French and then the rest of the installation process and the default language and everything was installed in French without you having to find the Drupal French distribution on Drupal.org and stuff like that. So um, a lot of really cool stuff happening with the multilingual initiative. So the Blocks and Layouts Initiative, or SCOTCH, because we can't have an initiative without a dumbass like, acronym of some kind that makes no sense. Um, this initiative is actually trying to solve a couple of problems in Drupal, the way it's architected. So right now, um, a typical page, I won't stray too far from the microphone here. Um, a typical page kind of is, is sort of a mess of a bunch of different things. So you have your main content area, right? And that's usually where your node is output or, or whatever the main area of the page is. Then you have some regions on the other side or in the top or the footer or whatever, and those have blocks in them. So stuff like a who's online block, powered by Drupal block, most recent pirate quotes block, or whatever it is. Um, and then you have all these other little bits that don't make any sense, like site logo, primary and secondary links. They're not blocks at all, they're just sort of things the theme outputs and they're sort of one-off special case things. And it's really, really difficult in order to sort of get any of these things to play nicely together, especially since each of those little bits has absolutely no clue about anything around it. So the who's online block only knows about rendering itself as a who's online block. It doesn't know that, by the way, who's online block, you're being rendered on a user profile, and that user profile has friends, and maybe you want to show the friends who are online of this person. It, it's dumb, and it doesn't know any of that stuff, and so there's a bunch of different solutions in Contrib to try and solve that problem, and it's really, really difficult. So what we want to change is sort of flipping that model upside down, where instead you have a request coming in, and this is all Symphony stuff. I'm going to wave my hands out, but basically, Symphony does magic, and then magic comes in, and there's a request, and the request carries with it the context of everything going on. So, hey, you're on a node page, or this is the currently logged in user, or the active language is French, or whatever it is. And then all of the blocks on this page have that knowledge of where they're at, and like where they are in the, in the uh, context of the full request. The other cool thing about this is that it allows us to render and cache each of these blocks individually. So, for example, um, if you're CNN.com, and uh, you have uh, you know, a header image that really never changes ever. Um, you have a couple of news stories in the, in the you know, banner area that maybe change once an hour or something like that. And then you have a stock ticker on the right side that needs to update all the time. You can actually cache those things independently and then serve the stuff that's static really, really fast and keep the stuff that's dynamic uh, you know, loading really fast, but you don't incur a whole page refresh in order to get just that one little bit on your page. 
That's the intent. We haven't quite got there yet. So if you know Symphony, um, and you know, and you have pain with the block system, it would be great if you could jump in and help with that. The UI is still undergoing massive refactoring and improvements. We haven't done a lot with the UI beyond some basic sort of stuff. Um, but definitely, uh, this is an area of, of hot debate. We have four weeks left, less than four weeks to get all this stuff in core. So there's people actively working right now on trying to get a blocks UI that we can use. And then once again, that responsive layout builder uh, that we built for Spark, uh, we are working on getting that into core as well. And this would bring with it the ability to tie, um, tie layouts to breakpoints and assign blocks and have them drop off in cases of mobile and all that kind of stuff. Um, so what we want to essentially do is move panels into core, except much more awesomer uh, panels. Page manager, plugin systems, content types, all these types and types of access relations, all these fancy, fancy terms, but hopefully with a much more streamlined UI that makes a lot more sense to people and eliminates the backflips that panels has to do right now in order to make that happen. Um, so Chris Vanderwater is the, the lead of this uh, initiative, Eclipse GC. Uh, and he hangs out in the Scotch, Drupal Scotch channel and uh, any kind of Scotch issue tag type of deals. Uh, this is one of my favorite site building improvements. Mother bleeping views and mother bleeping core. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So this just got committed, Jess, when? Uh, two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. Yay. Yay. So let's give a hand for views and core. So, you know, apart from the obvious advantages of having views in core, which is like, views is in core, this is actually what we're trying to solve. We're trying to solve this problem, sorry, my slide is messed up, um, where Drupal 7 came out in, you know, January of 2011, but it wasn't really until February of 2012 that you see the Drupal 6 and Drupal 7 usage stats cross, which means, like, more people are using Drupal 7 than Drupal 6, and that's a period of 13 months. So effectively what that means is that for 13 months after Drupal 7 came out, you had to kind of be a cowboy rock star ninja pirate. Did I leave out any nouns? I don't know. But anyway, you had to be one of those type of people Wizard. to use it. Wizard, Blue yes. A, a what? Wizard astronaut, yes. Wizard astronaut, OK. So a cowboy, I forget all the nouns. I have not slept very much. Right. Cowboy, cowboy, ninja pirate, wizard, astronaut, physicist. Ninja. And ninja, yes, all of those. Um, and that's bad, right? Because people worked their butts off to get all of these new improvements in, and you know, Drupal 7 had all these great features like image handling, which Nate Howe spearheaded. It had features like a new database abstraction layer that fixed all of the old crap with their database abstraction layer. It was just like a huge mess. So the good thing about having views in core is a lot of this kind of delay happens because contributed modules take a while to port. And um, two things happen when we move views into core. One is that because this major piece of functionality, as well as all the things it relies on, like C tools and things like that, are in the box, out of the, you know, in, out of the box in core, um, there are no contributor modules like blocked on this other piece of software that's huge, like porting every single time. And then the other great thing is that moving views into core has done more to validate the API changes that we've made in, you know, we, we make all these API changes thinking we're really smart and we're going to put this cool plugin system in. And yeah, and this configuration management system, it's all going to be beautiful and butterflies and rainbows and butterfly rainbow unicorn pony things. And, and then we get to RC1 when people actually use Drupal 8 and they're like, this shit doesn't work. And you're like, oh, but it's too late to change it now, so sorry, you know. So this has actually been great because we found out some of that stuff didn't work and we were able to fix it while there was still time to actually do something about it. So this has been a tremendous. Another thing that we're trying to solve is, uh, is what, this is something I hope people work on kind of after feature freeze, is uh, an initiative called Snowman. Is anybody familiar with that? It's kind of a weird, okay, yeah. <laughs> All the Drupal nerds in the front of the room right now. <laughs> um, so Snowman is like trying to solve this problem that you install Drupal standard profile and what does it do right out of the box? Nothing. Not quite. It, yeah, no, what it does is it tells you, you don't have any content yet. <laughs> That's what it does. It does nothing, right? It's like it has a couple of basic content types that have, serve no purpose. It like does all these things. And then, you know, there's some people who are like, well, that's, you know, we could totally make Drupal be an out-of-the-box example of something awesome Drupal could do, you know? And they started batting on all these ideas, like it could be an activist site, or it could be like, you know, like a, a community, like social networking forum, it could be all these things, except that 
What do you need in order to say, for example, build a list of users on the page, or you need to build a list of events? Views, right. So sort of like they needed to stick with core, but they couldn't actually do anything because you can't make an installation profile in core that actually has lists of anything other than like blog posts. So this is pretty awesome, and it's going to really, uh, I think, make Drupal 8 phenomenally better release than any release before it. Um, so this plan is all out of date, pretty much, because not only are 8.x branches alive and kicking, but the thing is actually in core now. Yeah, okay, so, so I haven't had a chance to update this since Munich because I, I explained that I am like trying to get it done. But it's really cool to see like in only two months, basically this whole thing has come leaps and bounds from where it was before. So I'm gonna say that's the reason I didn't update my presentation. Okay, um, so a bunch of API hardening, uh, incorporating views UI patterns, we've incorporated the drop button patterns, we can use that in other user interfaces. Um, somebody somewhere is working on a modal dialogue, which we could use in other places and that sort of thing. Um, changes for designers and front-end developers. So this is uh, if you are designer -y people in the room. Um, HTML5 was a big deal. Uh, this is where we, uh, does anybody know what HTML5? It's one more than HTML4. That's about all I know about it. No, I'm just kidding, yeah. So HTML5. HTML9, yeah. HTML9, responsive, grizz based, whatever, yeah, like that thing. Um, so HTML5 was sort of like all of the browser, this is gonna be my developer summary of this. It's all the browser manufacturers getting together and saying like, it's really dumb that we can't take advantage of these cool things on the web, so why don't we all get together and kind of agree on things? And they sort of discovered that, you know, there's actually a simplified syntax we can do for a lot of this stuff, and let's go ahead and invent new tags and patterns for these things, but that gracefully degrade in browsers that don't support them. So one big advantage of HTML5 is you now have these form elements, like form telephone, website, email, um, uh, number, these different types of fields that you can incorporate. And the cool thing about them is, like if you say something is a tell, like a telephone tag, then when you tab into that field on say a mobile device, it'll automatically know to switch the keyboard from like a normal alphabetical type of keyboard to one with a number pad because it's phone number. Um, email will automatically do email validation and so forth. And so these are all standard tools now available in Drupal's form API so that you can just use these standard HTML5 you know, form fields and they work in pretty much any modern browser. Even some of them even work in IE, wow. Um, I know, crazy. Um, this is another thing we did is we changed the doc type and several other things from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. So in Drupal 7, we used XHTML transitional, I think, 1.0, 1.1, something. It's up there, somewhere. Um, and uh, in Drupal 8, we made the decision to move to HTML5. Um, we also include a couple of meta tags to handle the, uh, the mobile parts of the, of the browser so it knows like here's what the viewport is and here's what all this kind of thing so you can react on it and all this kind of stuff. Um, we also engage on a whole lot of markup cleanup. So who here is familiar with HTML coming out of Drupal that looks like this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We wanted to take this on because our markup makes Jeffrey Zeldman cry. <laughs> oh. So, you know, there's been a lot of work on a lot of the uh, different templates to make that much more cleaner. Actually, JC and uh, Luisi sort of put together this uh, list of uh, standard components. So. You know, when I have uh, an HTML blurb that looks like this, here's what the nice, clean HTML version would be. Here's what the nice, clean PHP source version would be. And so they're starting to convert, and actually have in a lot of cases succeeded in converting a lot of these um, to this new, more streamlined, hey, front-end developers, we're not going to uh, get in your way anymore with putting 1,500 classes and 1,500 divs in your way. And uh, Twig is the method through which they're doing this. So Twig is a templating layer that we're borrowing from Symfony. And what it does is it essentially takes Drupal 7 code that looks kind of like this and turns it into code that looks kind of like this. So a couple of things that you'll notice um, is whenever there's like a PHP dollar sign thing, it's now like a brackety percent thing. So that means like execute this. Um, whenever it says print something, you just use double brackety something. Um, and there's a few other little syntax niceties. But what I really like about this, and this isn't really reflected in the example, because at the time I made this example, I, Twig made no sense to me. But what I really like about um, Twig is that one of the first things that we ever did when I, when I used to teach with Lullabot and we did intro theming classes, we have like a half an hour presentation on here's how to read 
you know, stuff coming out of PHP and knowing how to deal with it. Because so many things in Drupal are like node, arrow, field, brackety zero, brackety, brackety, field undefined language, whatever the crap, you know, it's just like all of this stuff. And it's really hard for people who don't know, even people who know PHP, it's really hard to know, okay, for that one you use an arrow thingy, for this one you use bracket thingies, for that one you, you know, do a moon dance, I don't know, you know, that kind of thing. It's a standard syntax in Twig, so that you just say node dot this dot that dot this, and it automatically figures out for you what that maps to on the backhand side. So that's a huge advantage. The other big advantage is that a lot of these things auto escape. So like, <laughs> there's some quote on the Twig issue that's like, within a rounding error, 100% of custom themes are vulnerable to XSS vulnerabilities. That basically, like, what you do when you do a custom theme is you throw out the stuff that Drupal gives you by default because it's so terrible, and you start printing individual fields out where you want them. Um, and that's great, except that a lot of those fields are raw, unsanitized values, and so you can run into the situation where someone, you know, says they're from the country of script alert XSS that suddenly you start getting XSS vulnerabilities on your pages, so it's bad. So Twig, it's, uh, it's different. It's apparently better. Themers like it. <coughs> but it's definitely going to be a little bit of a learning curve there. And then finally I have to add, on, uh, you know, end this section on kind of a sad note. Um, there was a dear, dearly departed friend uh, that left us this, uh, this release, which was, of course, IE 6 and 7. <laughs> Yay! 7-2? Uh, yeah. Yay! Yeah, who cares about 7? <laughs> so, Twig doesn't, does that completely replace the old Yes, so PHP template, well, right now there's a backwards compatibility layer, but PHP template is being removed. It'll probably still, I don't know if I'm lying, I think there's intentions of supporting it as an alternate theme layer, theme engine, so you could move your themes without rewriting them, but the, uh, I don't know for sure the status of that. I do know for sure that Twig is a completely new theme engine and it will be the default theme engine included in Drupal 8 and that was just committed yesterday during the keynote. So it's a good time to start reading up on it. Um, it's going to be quite a big change. Uh, they're not done with it yet and from my understanding there's actually a lot of opportunities if you are a front-end developer and this is directly in your wheelhouse to actually get involved with the folks working on this. So talk to Jen Lampton, talk to uh, Chicks, talk to Morton, talk to John Albin, there's a whole bunch of people here that are working on, on that stuff. How many people here are coders? Yeah, right, awesome. So this is where we get to my favorite uh, part of the presentation because things are about to get geeky. Right? Um, so the first is the uh, Web Services Initiative. Um, it's sort of like services module in core, but better. And so the problem we're trying to solve with Web Services in core is like right now, um, Drupal assumes that whenever it gets a page request, what it's going to output is it's going to output a fully themed HTML page with the contents of your web page wrapped up in your theme and with the sidebars and all of that kind of stuff, and then it's going to serve it to a desktop browser, right? Because that was a safe assumption to make back in, you know, 2008 when we were building Drupal 7. Unfortunately, that is no longer the case. Nowadays, Drupal is sort of this central hub that needs to be able to output content to anything, literally anything. It could be a refrigerator, it could be an iPhone, it could be an Android application, it could be another Drupal site entirely, or it could be a desktop browser, right? You have no idea. Um, so the plan for Drupal 8 is to change uh, a bunch of the fundamental stuff in, uh, as far as the routing system goes in Drupal to Symfony. And so we're using a number of Symfony components. Anyone here ever played with Symfony before? Okay, so everybody's a coder, and then how many people have played with Symfony? No, like three people, right. So if you haven't, I really, really, really encourage you to go to this untypable URL. Um, just go, go to um, fabian.potentiae.org. This is the, the Symfony lead. Um, he's got this 12-step blog post that talks, he's taking a picture so that he can use, you know, optical scanning to type it for him. That's smart. Um, yeah, so, so uh, it's a 12-part blog post which sounds absolutely terrifying, but it's really great because what it does is it starts you out with just a simple PHP page that takes name coming in as a get argument and then outputs it uh, in a print statement that pretty much any of us have probably written as our first PHP, uh, you know, application before we knew better. 
And then it walks you through all of the reasons that's wrong and then all of the things that you would do to fix it and then slowly starts to introduce, like, this is why you would use this component and this is why you would use that component. And it's actually very well written. And I am not very smart, but I was able to kind of get Symphony a little bit in about two hours. So if you have a free afternoon at some point, this is a really good, uh, really good thing to read. And it kind of, it, you know, it's, it's 12 parts. You don't need to read all 12. I would say you read, read, read the first four or so and you've got kind of the gist of it. So Symphony is basically a, an actual framework, as opposed to what Drupal is, which is sort of a framlication. You know, we have a framework, kinda, it, but it's mainly to power our application, which is Drupal. Um, PHP is an, or, sorry, Symphony is an actual framework where it's a bunch of low-level components that they wrap a nice UI around, or sorry, not a UI at all, a, an API around, so that you can do these different tasks, and it's very loosely coupled and very easy to pull in just the things that you need. So we're using the uh, HTTP kernel component of Symphony. We're using the routing component of Symphony. Uh, we're using a bunch of different ones. And what effectively that means is that hook menu, um, our dear beloved friend hook menu that just gets all this crap crammed into it at any given time, is, um, is going to be massively changed in Drupal 8, although we still don't quite know how <laughs> yet, which is a little scary. But essentially, one of the things we're doing is we're splitting hook menu from hook router. So hook router being the thing that, you know, say, this is the path, and this is what you should do when you come to the path, and this is how I know if you can access the path or not. And then expanding hook router with the ability to not only do HTTP get requests, um, assuming HTML, but splitting that so you can do put requests or pull requests or post requests or whatever the stupid, there's one called patch, I think. I don't know. There's a bunch of silly capital letter words. And um, it has the ability to do those things and then also splitting up the content type. So instead of getting a get request for HTML, I want to get requests for JSON or I want to get requests for XML or I want to get requests for this. Um, and what the intent of this is is actually to turn Drupal into a first class REST framework out of the box that just happens to output HTML pages. So to an end user, it won't look any different, but to a developer, it gets you a whole lot more you know, flexibility than you had before. Um, and Lynn Clark is one of the people leading this. Uh, she is working on uh, entity serialization in JSON-LD. Yes, okay. Um, but the ability basically to take any entity in, in all of Drupal, so your users, your nodes, your whatever you have, and uh, outputting that, and, and being able to transfer it between websites or take it to a mobile application, or am I making things up? No, you're totally fine. Yes, okay, great. Um, so that's really powerful, especially in the age where as we go forward, it's going to be the assumption that we're serving HTML to desktop browsers is no longer gonna be a valid assumption. So that's really cool. So this initiative is being led by Larry Garfield Krell. Uh, you can find him because he's the man in the vest and the red hair who looks a little bit like Bill Gates, but don't tell him you said that because he'll really get mad. Um, <laughs> they meet in the uh, whiskey that's pronounced channel because again, we can't have an initiative without a silly name. Um, and that's uh, what he does. He's here. I don't know that he's staying beyond tonight though, um, but uh, lots of action happening in the Drupal whiskey queue, the channels, all that kind of stuff. So. Uh, again, none of you do know Symphony, but if you learn Symphony over the weekend in two hours and want to help with whiskey, that would be awesome. So. Um, configuration management is the next big one. By the way, I think I have to stop soon, right? At like, no? no? Ten, minutes. Ten minutes. Awesome. Okay. Configuration management is the next thing. This is this problem where like you have like node ID four on site one, and then you have node ID four on site two, and you try and smush them together, and carnage happens. Um, so the problem that we're trying to solve here <clears throat> is where you have, uh, you know, the reason we all love Drupal is like you have all these little forms and you just click them and you click save and things happen and it's great, right? You don't need to know any coding, it's all lovely. So you know admin content foo, you create your node test over your dev server, that's all saving directly to a database. <laughs> then at the same time you have your live site over here, which has a different text, you know, it says old text over here and it's got a node for, a real node for, which is your welcome page, right? Um, and that's also being served and saved to from a database. The problem happens when you try and move those things from one place to the other, right? Because node four and node four completely collide with each other. So if you take node four from here and you move it over there, all of a sudden your welcome page is gonna turn into test, 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 test. And then over here, you know, if you try and take the entire database changes, it's gonna not only take the, the configuration change you made, but also the content changes, your user changes. You'll obliterate people who sign up to your website, which is not a very nice thing to tell the uh, marketing team. They kind of front on that. Um, so we try to solve this in a number of different ways, right? 
We have variable get and variable set. We do database queries. We do hook update. We do update functions to go back and forth on the site. We kind of hard code things in settings.php. We use features. We use C tools, exports. We do all of these manner of things, and they're all half baked, and they all only work for certain things and don't work for other things, and it's basically just a huge mess. So the plan in Drupal 8 is to do this instead. And this is a little bit out of date. So um, when you save and when you, you know, save your different configuration, instead of this going to a database, pretend that isn't here, this goes instead to a file store. So the second that you save a form, it saves right to the files directory in a YAML file. Um, and then there's a cache of that information, so you don't have to do a file seek every time you look at anything on the page, which is in the database by default. But this is actually swappable, so you can put a uh, memcache there, or people talk about Redis and all these other types of things. But anyway, you can put something here other than the database to kind of speed things up. But the main thing is that these files now are, are or, or these configuration changes are now saved on disk so that you can diff them and you can do things like move them over with version control and stuff like that. Um, and that's a big freaking deal um, because you no longer have to deal with your database having both your configuration and your content. Instead, your configuration is on disk, like any other file that can be moved around, and your content is in your database. The other cool thing about your content in Drupal 8 is it now comes with UUIDs or unique universally unique identifiers, something like that. But basically, you can tell that node 4 over here and node 4 over there are different because they both have different like gobbledygook names. And so that allows you to really easily tell, oh, this thing that I created in development is not yet on production, so let me push it, without paying attention to these stupid numeric IDs that basically have no meaning. Um, so that's actually a really big deal. Configuration management is, is wildly awesome. We just committed yesterday a patch so you can actually have the, the user interface for this, so yay. Um, and the way it's going to work is you essentially, your file store, you have an active directory, and that's where uh, you save to and read from on, on any given site. And then you also have a staging directory for, your, for, for each site. So if you want to move from development to live, what you do is you take the YAML files in your active directory, you move them to the staging directory on your production server, then there's a little UI where you click an import button, and I'm sure someone probably has already written a Drush script for this as well. And what it will do is it will take the changes from the file system and refresh the database contents with them. Um, and then there's other little magic in there, but that's essentially how it works. So pretty awesome stuff. Uh, Greg uh, Dunlap is the initiative lead of that. It does not have a funny name. Greg is not very creative, and we're very disappointed in him. No, I'm but uh, uh, they're uh, working on the uh, configuration management uh, or configuration system issue tag or the CMI IRC channel. There's also all kinds of other stuff that I don't have time to cover here. Probably one of the most significant improvements is the uh, entity API got so much better than it was in uh, Drupal 7. In Drupal 7, we made a nice little like loader system or for the for the API, but for anything else, you had to go get the entity API module from um, from Contrib if you actually wanted a full featured entity API. But the entity API in Drupal has full CRUD support, so create, read, update, delete is all included. Um, it's all object oriented. Uh, it's all got I don't know. It's got provisions on things not just on nodes. Uh, the ability to support draft revisions is now available, so you, you know, have the, uh, the opportunity to edit something that's not immediately available on your live site. Um, there's been file and media API improvements, so like expanding the uh, file system to support those kinds of things. Um, a lot of changes to make the test bot faster. Test bot is our continuous integration environment where every patch that we upload to our issue queue gets running as the test bot, and Jimmy Berry knows a little something about that. Um, over there in the Linux shirt. Uh, we did a lot of things with our tests to speed them up dramatically so they didn't take as long. And then we made a bunch of changes to make our entire system slower. So we didn't really balance out in the end, but we're working on it and it'll be fine. Um, yeah, and just in general, there's been an overall meme of like, proudly found elsewhere. So in past releases of Drupal, we really had sort of this mentality that we can do it better than other people. In some cases that was true, but in other cases it was really not true. You know, and, and we sort of like arrived at this position where it was like, you know, we really felt strongly we need, there's all these debates about small core and all this kind of stuff. And what they were so, you know, really coming from is like, we need to make Drupal more decoupled, we need to make it faster, we need to make it more modern and employ more modern things. And we were stuck with the option of like, well, we can either rewrite all of our freaking code, or we can go and find people who've already figured out this problem and borrow from them. And there's been a lot of that, and I think it's overall been for the best. 
Um, so we've been, instead of trying to go at it on our own a lot, we've been actually looking, well, what are other people doing and how are they solving these problems? And so you'll find Drupal 8 shipping with not only our own stuff, but also other people's stuff and a lot of work to integrate those two things tightly together. So if you want to know all of the changes, there's a page on Drupal.org called Drupal.org slash list hyphen changes. And this has got the full list of everything and you can sort of filter it down by things that affect themers or module developers, that kind of thing. I'd like to take a moment to give a huge round of applause. And that 600 is so out of date at this point. It's probably at well over 1,000. But yeah, let's give it up for them. <laughs> and of course, we want you. Because um, I have to give my obligatory picture of scary clouds and dire warnings. So, um, so oh, those scary clouds are not nearly so scary on a wash day. Well, whatever. Um, but yeah. So there's a lot of people who are really working hard on Drupal 8, and they are pouring their hearts and souls into Drupal 8 to make it awesome and rock. Um, but they get burnt out. They get feeling like they're not, uh, their, their things aren't really making a difference, that people don't appreciate what they're doing. They're begging for help. They're not getting it. You know, they're trying to do support things, like Jess is you know, working on uh, mentoring new contributors and is trying to do that and also straddle the views and core initiative and stuff like that. And we really do need more people who are interested in making Drupal awesome to help, especially since we're about to enter a phase of our release cycle where a lot of people who have been pushing really hard on Drupal are about to leave because they've been pushing hard for the last two years. And uh, we're done with feature freeze in December. And at that point, we're really going to need an influx of people to help us standardize the components, get rid of bugs, uh, find ways to integrate things, better DX, that kind of thing. So it would really be great if you care about these or any other people on the world that you would help us um, kind of jump in there and show that you're interested. And that would really, really help morale. It would keep things going. And it would lead to Drupal 8 being the most amazing release ever. So thank you very much. I don't want to end on that. Give me a second to end on something happier. Here we go. I'm going to end on that. Yay. OK. Thanks, everybody. Oh, and by the way, if you ever want to start contributing to Core and you've never done it before, um, these are set-aside mentoring times that you can come on IRC and get hand-tutored by very advanced Core developer type people who already pre-vetted lists of things for you to work on. Um, so whether you have no idea what Git is or whether you uh, are an expert at this stuff but you've never really dealt with Core, or whether you're just like, hey, I already know Core development. I'm looking for something fun to do. Tell me what's important and what's cool to work on. We can help you, we can connect you with people, anything that you need. So, yes, thank you. And I think I'm done. I don't want to dig into Nate's time. That was a lot of, you guys sound like zombies. <laughs> 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 Are there quick questions? Yes. Uh, is Render API still in Google or is that, or what's, what's, the, what's, the, what's the deal with Render API? Um, right now it's still in Drupal 8. And Twig is essentially like uh, an abstraction layer over render API, so we don't expose people to all of that horror. Um, we're still going to need it as well for form API, because um, we looked at Symfony form component, but it's not quite baked enough for us to put into a release that's going to have to sit there for five years. Um, so we're still having it around for that. I think the ultimate fate of render API is TBD. I think we'll probably, in real, realistically, we'll probably still keep it for Drupal 8. Um, and then probably aim to kick it really to the curb in Drupal 9. But of course, if that's something that actively ticks you off and you want to take that on, I know, talk to Chicks, he'd be happy to help you with that. So, yeah. Yes? Um, in regards to encouraging people to transfer from 7 to 8, uh, do you see it being very difficult for uh, people to develop their own custom modules for what they need to do? I mean, do you see that being very difficult to transfer those? Uh, yes. So the question was, uh, is it very difficult for people with a lot of custom code to move from 7 to 8? And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, this is why we actively encourage people to not write custom code if you can possibly help it and stick on standard community contributed modules like views and fields and all these kinds of things. Because those will have an upgrade path ensured for them, but your code won't. But what I will say about that is that in Drupal 7 anyway, uh, there were some community members like uh, Jim Barry, uh, Jimmy's father, who really banded around the idea of automated tools to help take the pain out of that process in a lot of cases. So uh, from, if you're moving from 6 to 7, for example, there's a module called Coder Upgrade that will uh, take that big list of changes I showed you, and it has little uh, like grammar parsing rules for each one of those, and it will say, take your uh, Drupal 6 module, and it will scan through, and it will spit out a Drupal 7-ish module that probably picks off like 80% of the things. And then you need to kind of like flesh it out from there. 
So no one's working on that actively right now because there's, it's not done yet. Um, but I would imagine like around April when the code freeze type of thing sits in and we're a little bit less moving APIs around all the time, that would be an ideal time for a bunch of people like to w chime in there and, and kind of do stuff. And Jimmy, you have your hand up. Do you have things yeah, to say about that? Oh. Basically, hasn't fallen month that list changes are already. Like, vast majority of those are basically already Oh, great. So Jim, Jimmy's dad is going to solve your problem. <laughs> Done. <laughs> okay. Anything else? I don't know where Nate went, but he's not here, so I guess I can answer any more questions. No? Yeah. So between code freeze and release, what are you doing? What am I going to be doing? Not sleeping, that's for sure. Oh. <laughs> So between code freeze and release, um, the, the frenzy of core committing goes down quite a bit after feature freeze, but there's still quite a lot of work to do. Sorry, not freeze, code, freeze. code freeze and release. Oh, I'm going to have a baby, so that's kind of a big deal. Um, so I don't know if I'm taking a vacation, but I definitely won't be getting sleep. But luckily, I'm well trained on how to not have sleep, so that's good. Is that what you were, were you kind of doing that? Or? No, I was just curious what code. Yeah, so what we'll be working on at that point is, so after code freeze, we're basically done making API changes. Um, and at that point, what it'll be down to is a lot of, a lot of what well, we hope, a lot of contributed module developers will come in at code freeze and say, okay, now it's safe, let me try porting my module and see what happens. So probably the majority of it will be fixing any release blocking bugs that are still left at that point. It'll be on uh, tweaking performance uh, if it's not tweaked enough. It'll be on things like hammering out UI text and you know, some of the, the smaller, finer grain points. They're basically polishing, more or less. Um, and what's that? I heard something, but I think I need to get off the stage. So thank you very much, everybody. Quite a reputation as a troublemaker. It's <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, there's Nate. He's, he's working on something that's causing problems again. <laughs> uh, nod. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 u